الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد uh, We were discussing the stories of the seerah and we're trying to lay the foundations for the actual seerah of the Prophet, the hijrah of the Prophet وسلم, We discussed many of the other hijras that took place and the point that we need to underscore the Prophet was really one of the last, if not the last uh, adult Muslim to emigrate to Medina. The only people left after the Prophet were some of the women and children such as the family of Abu Bakr, such as Ali. Otherwise basically all of the adults had migrated uh, before and there's only one story left before we get to the actual story of the Prophet Hijrah and that is the story of Umar ibn al-Khattab which is a very brief story and it shows the bravery of Umar and the uh, the the methodology that Umar ibn al-Khattab had. Ali ibn Abi Talib narrates that I don't know of anybody who did the Hijrah publicly except for Umar. I don't know of anybody who did the Hijrah publicly except for Umar. Everybody was sneaking away. Everybody was doing it in the middle of the night. Except for Umar ibn al-Khattab, he was the only Muslim to do the Hijrah and make it public. He packed his bags, he armed himself and wore his uh, shield and his uh, arrows and everything. And he went to the Kaaba and did tawaf seven times. And he's dressed as a traveler, he's prepared as a traveler. And then he makes a public announcement. O oh, people of Mecca, whoever amongst you wishes that his mother lose him tonight, or that his children become orphans, or that his wife becomes a widow, then know that I'm performing the hijrah and you can meet me outside of Mecca in such and such a valley. This is the only person who performed hijrah, making it public, and of course, nobody took up Umar on that challenge. And this again shows us the status of Umar, and this is why our Prophet ﷺ made dua, Allahumma a'izz al-Islam bi ahab al-Umaraini ilayk, that, oh Allah, bless Islam with the more beloved of the Umars to you. The other one was being Abu Jahl, because his name was also Amr. Uh, and so Amr is a type of Umar, one of the means of, um, ways of saying Umar is Amr and, and, and Uwaymir and Amir, all of these from the same root of Amr uh, and Umar. Uh, and so the Prophet said, bless Islam with one of the two Umars who is more beloved to you. And so Allah Azza wa Jal loved Umar ibn al-Khattab uh, uh, and Abu Jahl has a different fate as we know. So this is the final story that we have of the hijras uh, of the other Sahaba. And I mentioned the rest of them before, Suhaib al-Rumi and Ayyash ibn Rabi'a and Salam ibn Hisham. I mentioned all of them uh, last week. And so we now get to the actual hijrah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And... As usual, we need to piece together the incident of the hijrah from many different stories. Again, one of the problems of the seerah is that the seerah is not written down in one story. We have different reports, just like we have for Isra wal Mi'raj, just like we have for Badr. We need to piece together the puzzle. So, we have a number of stories. The first of them, the most authentic of them, Aisha narrating in Sahih Bukhari, the first person. Aisha narrating her memories of the hijrah as a young girl. Aisha at this time is around six or seven years old. So this is basically her first memories of Islam. And Aisha radiallahu anha says, and the hadith is in Bukhari, so it's fully authentic. I don't remember any day except that my parents were Muslims. I.e. as far back as I can remember, my parents were Muslims. So Aisha obviously was born and Abu Bakr was already a Muslim at the time. right? Aisha is born and Abu Bakr is already a Muslim. And she is the younger of the two. Asma bint Abi Bakr is older. And Asma has a different mother. And Asma's mother was not a Muslim. She was a mushrik. So Abu Bakr divorced her. Abu Bakr divorced Asma's mother. And he married Aisha's mother. And so Aisha says, I don't remember a day except that both of my parents were upon the religion of Islam. And I don't remember any day except that the Prophet would come visiting us in our house. So her earliest memories, every day Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is coming to us, sometimes in the morning and even in the evening. And then Aisha narrates that when the Prophet sallallahu was given the permission to migrate, and he told the Muslims to migrate, Abu Bakr prepared a camel to migrate to, to Medina. And he asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for permission. Every Muslim asked the Prophet for permission for everything that he did. And the Prophet said, wait, for I 
hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us permission. I hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us permission. فَإِنِّي أَرْجُوا أَنْ يُؤْذَنَ لِي Meaning, I'm waiting for Allah to give us this permission. So, uh, so Abu Bakr understood that the permission that the, the Prophet is waiting for is permission for him to accompany the Prophet on the hijrah. And so when Abu Bakr heard this, he asked, As-suhba ya Rasulullah, are you hoping for my companionship? Meaning, can I be with you? Is that what you're hoping for? And so the Prophet said, yes, this is what I'm hoping for. And this shows us as well that the Prophet never did anything except with the permission of Allah and after asking Allah. The Prophet did not undertake any major decision without getting permission from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so everybody's allowed to emigrate, but he's not migrating. Why? Because Allah did not tell him to do so yet. So he says, wait Abu Bakr, I hope that perhaps you might be given uh, permission. So when Abu Bakr heard this, he prepared two camels instead of one. He prepared two camels. What does it mean to prepare a camel? You all know that a camel is the ship of the desert. You all know that a camel... Uh, is able to carry its food and its water on its back, right? But in order to do so, you need to feed the camel special diet. And you need to cause it to drink extra water. And you actually have to give it salt in order to cause it to drink water. Believe it or not, obviously. You have to give the camel salt, so you force it to drink water. So you prepare it for a few weeks, and then the hump appears. You give it a special type of diet, you keep it locked up so that it doesn't burn its fat, and you just feed it, feed it, feed it, and you give it water, and it will uh, have that extra hump on his back. So this is what Abu Bakr is saying, I'm preparing two camels. When the Prophet said this, I prepared two uh, camels. And he said, I did this for four months. Now, scholars say this might be like a little bit of exaggeration because it's actually been three and a half months, so he's making it up to four. Right? So because when the Prophet ﷺ told the people to emigrate, and then when he emigrated, this is a, 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 an interim of three and a half months. So he's just rounding up, as we say, not exaggeration, but rounding up. Not three and a half, but rather uh, four months. And this took place in Dhul Hijjah of the 13th year of the mission. Dhul Hijjah of the 13th year of the... Uh, of the uh, uh, to be more precise, okay, let's be more precise. The 12th year of the prophetic message in the month of Dhul Hijjah, and then in Muharram it becomes the 13th year. Right? Because Muharram is when we begin the year. So in the Muharram of the 13th, and then the Safar, the Prophet ﷺ, according to our best estimates, he didn't say this, it's not in any hadith, but we're trying to estimate. According to our best estimates, how do we estimate? We know a number of details. We know that he was the last to emigrate. We know that he emigrated on a Monday. Because Ibn Abbas says in Sahih Muslim that the Prophet reported that on Monday, Iqra was revealed to me. I became a Prophet. And on Monday, I was born. And on Monday, I emigrated. So Monday, is a day all of these things occurred. So looking back at the calendars that we are able to derive, we see which of these days corresponds to a number of facts and the closest date that some of our modern researchers have, have developed is the 26th of Safar. The 26th of Safar in the 13th year of the Da'wah, this would basically be the first year of the Hijrah. Right? Because the Hijrah actually occurred in Safar and not in Muharram. And I've mentioned in other places in a khutbah why the Sahaba chose Muharram to mark the beginning of the calendar. That has nothing to do with the Prophet it has to do with something else. So Muharram of that year, then Safar, the 26th of Safar, the Prophet actually uh, emigrated. What happened? On that day, in the daytime, in the daytime of the Monday, Aisha is narrating the same hadith, that when we were sitting in our house, at the peak of the heat of the day, at noontime, Shiddat al zahira it's a hot day. And in Arabia, in fact in every hot climate, and Spain is one example of this, they have the siesta and all of this, in every hot climate, in the middle of the day, everything just shuts down. And people just take a nap because there's nothing else they can do. It's too hot to go outside. It's a qaylula, it's a siesta. You take a nap. And this is a culture that... Not only did our Prophet find, he encouraged it. And he encouraged the Muslims to take this afternoon nap. 
And everybody knows, scientists, doctors, they all tell us, when you take this nap, it makes you energetic and it makes you better prepped for the day uh, to have a little nap in the afternoon. So the Prophet advised us and encouraged us to have this afternoon nap. So this was the time, in this nap time, where Aisha says that in the, in the Shiddat al-Har, in the hot time of the day, we saw a figure approaching. And the streets were deserted, nobody's there. And the figure had wrapped his turban around his head. Muqanna'an is, it's like the man who wraps the turban around his face, you cannot see him. Until we recognize from the distance that it is the Prophet wasallam. Now obviously when you know somebody very well, even if they cover their face, you can recognize from the body, from even the thawb, anything you can recognize, this is that particular uh, person. And so we said, Wallahi, the only reason he must be coming is for something very Grave to have occurred. This is an emergency. Nobody comes at this time for something very grave to have occurred. So the Prophet ﷺ asked permission to come in. Abu Bakr granted it to him. And he said, remove everybody from the room. Now in those days, the houses were not divided into different rooms. They were divided into compartments. Hujurat. The houses didn't have these massive mansions as we do. You walk in here and there. Rather, you built a house... And then you would have chambers, you would have curtains that would have private rooms in it, right? So the Prophet does not know who's inside these rooms. So he tells Abu Bakr, get everybody else out. Whoever, whatever woman is here, get her out. And Abu Bakr said, Ya Rasulullah, they are but your family, that's it. I eat Aisha and her sister, that's all there was there. And of course, uh, Aisha had already been uh, engaged to the Prophet ﷺ, the nikah had been done and the consummation had not yet <laughs> occurred. So the nikah has already taken place and, uh, and uh, Abu Bakr says, Ya Rasulullah, this is only your family. Nobody else is here. And so Aisha is narrating first person. She's hearing from behind the curtains. She's hearing because she's in the house. So Aisha is narrating first person uh, this story. And so Abu Bakr says, there's only, there's only your family here, meaning Abu ba- uh, Aisha and, and Asma. And so Abu, uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, Allah has given me permission to emigrate. Allah has given me permission to emigrate. Now Abu Bakr was waiting for permission to come to him as well. And so he asked him, Ya Rasulullah as suhba O Messenger of Allah, did Allah allow me to be the companion? Ya Rasulullah as suhba Bi abi anta wa ummi. I beg you by, by my mother and father. Did Allah give this permission? And the Prophet ﷺ said, Naam. Yes, the permission has been given for you to accompany me. Aisha says this hadith is in Bukhari. Uh, and this addition is in Ibn Ishaq. Aisha says that I saw Abu Bakr cry. And I had never believed that people could cry out of happiness until I saw Abu Bakr cry out of happiness on that day. Aisha is saying, I never believed that people cried when they got happy. Crying is something you do when you're sad, when you're worried, when you're distressed. Aisha says, I never believed that people could cry when they're happy until I saw my own father, Abu Bakr, cry when the permission was given to migrate with the Prophet ﷺ. And so the Prophet ﷺ told Abu Bakr that he was going to uh, migrate with him. Abu Bakr said, Ya Rasulullah, I have prepared two camels. One of them is yours. SubhanAllah, the Prophet ﷺ did not have a camel even in Mecca. He didn't have a camel. I have prepared two camels. One of them is yours. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Illa bithaman. Only if I pay you the price of the camel till, till it becomes mine. I'm not going to take it as a free gift. I'm not going to take it as a freebie. SubhanAllah. Why? Because this is of the perfection of his manners, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's the perfection of his manners, even though he's Rasulullah. He doesn't take advantage and flout it, do this and do that. Until I pay its price, then I'll take it from you. And also because he wanted the full reward of doing the hijrah. Because as we all know, if you help somebody doing some good deed, what happens? You get a share. And so the Prophet wants the full reward. I'm going to pay for it myself. And I'm going to migrate on the camel that I own. And so uh, Abu Bakr was basically forced to uh, take us some from the Prophet to give him that uh, camel. And Asma, who is Aisha's older sister, Aisha is too young to do anything. And Asma is at least 15 years older than her, 10 to 15 years older than her. Asma is basically an adult already. And Aisha is a little girl, she cannot prepare anything. So Asma had already prepared food and reserves for them. And so 
in the uh, panic of the moment, she bundled up all of the food and she didn't have anything to tie the bag with. And so she took off her belt, and in those days the belt is nothing other than some, you know, grope or something. She took off her own belt and tore it in half with her teeth and used half of a belt for her own uh, garment and then used the other half for the bag uh, of the Prophet and Abu Bakr, and that is why she was called Zatun Nitaqain, she of the two belts. This is, this is the laqab, this is the title. If anybody says, who is she of the two uh, belts? This is the title that was given to Asma binti Abi Bakr because of this incident. That she took off her own belts, cut it in half, and then she just used half of it to try to keep her own uh, 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 blouse and skirt on, and the rest of it she used for the uh, food of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And Abu Bakr had at this point in time five thousand uh, dirhams. And uh, Ibn Ishaq narrates that when Abu Bakr accepted Islam, he was a wealthy man who had forty thousand dirhams. And by the time he emigrated, 35,000 of them had been gone. For what? For saving people like Bilal. For basically purchasing almost every single slave he could find in Mecca that was being persecuted. He spent 90% of his wealth completely for the sake of Islam. And when he emigrated, he took the entire amount with him. 5,000 dirhams he took with him. And uh, side tangent here, but when he took this amount, Abu Bakr's father, Abu Qahafa, and Abu Qahafa did not accept Islam until after the conquest of Mecca. Abu Qahafa was an open enemy, a sarcastic enemy, in that he always mocked his own son. How could you have accepted the faith of this man? And he was already a bitter old man. He was a blind old man who had a sharp tongue, already had a sharp tongue. And Abu Qahafa, when Abu Bakr left with the Prophet we're jumping the gun, but just to take, t tell the story, Abu Qahafa came to Asma, mocking Abu Bakr for having abandoned the two little girls without any money. What type of father is this? He has left you with no money? He had all of this wealth, he's taken it all for his companion, has left nothing for you? And so Asma, subhanAllah, look at her iman and her intelligence, and he's a, <laughs> he's a blind man. Asma took the uh, money jar, it wasn't a jar, it was a sackcloth that Abu Bakr kept his money in, and quickly picked up some pebbles and threw them in there. And wrapped the money jar in some more cloth, and said, no, my grandfather, he has left us some money. Here, look. And she gave him the bag that Abu Bakr kept for his money. So you know this is the bag that is the money bag. And so he felt it, and he felt it a heavy amount, right? So he said, okay, I, I'm mistaken. If this is what he has left for you, then there is nothing to, to blame. Even though Asma says, he didn't leave us a penny. Why? Because he wants every penny for the Prophet ﷺ, and he expects somebody will give them food and water and they're not going to starve to death in Mecca. They're not in the middle of the desert. There are people that are going to give them the basic to live. We are going in the middle of the desert. We don't know where we're going to need this money, who we're going to have to pay off. So he took every last dirham that he had and he left nothing with Asma and, uh, and Aisha. And of course Allah took care of them and eventually they made their way to uh, Medina. Now, there is, uh, this is the version of Bukhari, and the version of Bukhari is, as always, Bukhari's versions are always the most concise, the least detailed. You want the juicy details, you need to go to the other books. And the problem with the other books is, many times they don't have authentic isnads. Right? So, as we said many times over and over again, these types of traditions, no problem in narrating them, but we should sift through that which we know as a fact, versus that whose isnads might be slightly weak. When we turn to uh, Musnad Imam Ahmad, we have a hadith that gives us a little bit more description about what happened on that particular night. And Ibn Abbas says Allah revealed in the Quran one ayah describing that night, the night of the Hijrah. And that is Surah Al Anfal, verse 30. Surah Al Anfal, verse 30, Ibn Abbas said, This is an ayah that talks about the Hijrah. What is Surah Al Anfal, verse 30? وَإِذْ يَمْكُرُ بِكَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لِيُثْبِتُوكَ أَوْ يَخْرُجُوكَ أَوْ يَقْتُلُوكَ وَيَمْكُرُونَ وَيَمْكُرُ اللَّهُ وَاللَّهُ خَيْرُ الْمَاكِرِينَ When the people who disbelieved plotted secretly to either try to imprison you, لِيُثْبِتُوكَ أَوْ يُخْرِجُوكَ Or to exile you, أَوْ يَقْتُلُوكَ Or to kill you. 
when they plotted secretly to do one of these three things and Allah Azza wa Jal plotted and they plotted and Allah is the blessed best of those who plan so Ibn Abbas says this ayah talks about that night what happened that night they came together in Darun Nadwa Darun Nadwa was their parliament and they came together in the middle of the night. There was a secret meeting. And representatives from all of the tribes of the Quraysh came except for the Banu Hashim. Except for the Banu Hashim. But the Banu Hashim did not come. They weren't invited. And so Abu Lahab was not invited for this meeting. Because it would have been a conflict of interest. Even though his heart would have been with them, his presence would have jeopardized it. This is a bit deep here. Think about this. They intentionally left Abu, uh, Abu Lahab out of the meeting. Why? Because they were planning to harm one of his relatives, immediate relatives, his nephew. And no matter how much Abu Lahab wouldn't have minded that, he couldn't have officially given the green light for that. As they say, ignorance is bliss, right? So if Abu Lahab didn't know, Abu Lahab doesn't have to answer. Even though they knew that his heart would have been with them. You guys following this point here, right? Is that very crafty of them to leave Abu Lahab out. They know exactly what they're doing. And they also left out another very important figure. And that is Mut'im ibn Adi. Who is Mut'im ibn Adi? Mut'im ibn Adi is the one who's basically allowed the Prophet to remain in Mecca. It's his protection, not Abu Lahab's. They've left him out because once again, Mut'im has given his word. And he cannot take it back in a private meeting. right? And this shows us, despite their evil and conniving, there is some sense of dignity. There is some sense that we cannot invite these two people. Even though they're pagans, they're not Muslims. But Mut'im has given his word. right? He's the one, the passport, if you like, the visa is from Mut'im. That I'm giving you protection. So they can't invite Mut'im to the meeting. right? And Abu Lahab, no matter how much he hates his own nephew, and he was, he's even withdrawn his protection. But Abu Lahab cannot get his hands guilty with the blood. Because that would be something that, forget, he doesn't care, but it's, it's embarrassing for the public. Not that he loves this nephew, he doesn't at all. Right? If he had his way, he would have been killed a long time ago. But it's a matter of tribal honor. It's a matter of the, the, the customs of the time. How could Abu Lahab allow his own nephew to get killed knowingly? This would have been a shame for Abu Lahab as long as he lived. So, he also was not invited. Who was invited? The rest of the seniors and the elders. And in one, uh, so basically the, uh, uh, the, the descendants of Abd Manaf, the descendants of, of Qusayd, the descendants of other sub-tribes of the Quraysh, not the Banu Hashim, and not Mut'im ibn uh, Adi. And it is also said uh, in a narration that has a slight uh, missing link in it, uh, Qatada, who is a tabi'i, narrates from, from this time, and he never saw this time, there's a missing link, uh, that an old man came knocking on the door in the middle of the night. I mean, this is a secret meeting, nobody is supposed to know about it. And when they opened the door, they saw a man, they could not recognize who he was. They said, who are you? He said, I am a leader from the Najd. I'm not from here, I'm the leader from the Najd. And it has reached me that you're having a meeting, and allow me to come, perhaps I can benefit you with my wisdom about what you're planning to do. And uh, Ibn Abbas says this was shaitan. This was shaitan who wanted to seal the plot, make sure that the actual plot that was done was that of assassination. When they came together, they began talking to one another and they said, the Muslims have now migrated to another land. And we are scared if we allow this man to leave, they will become a political threat to Mecca. Because again, up until now, the Muslims have been in their control. Up until now, they've all been in Mecca. Now everybody has migrated. They all know that one person is left. That's the Prophet with Abu Bakr. Everybody else has gone. So they have a meeting the very night of before the Hijrah, the very night before the immigration. They have a meeting and they say, we need to do, do something. Now realize the Hijrah was because of this meeting. Right? The hijrah, the timing of the hijrah was because of this meeting. Because they plotted, Allah Azza wa Jal plotted. That's what Allah is saying. So they came together on that night and they gave some suggestions. The first suggestion, let's imprison him in a house. 
Now there's no such thing really as a prison in Arabia at the time. They didn't have a concept of a prison and if they had to imprison somebody it was an exceptional thing. It was not, the concept of putting somebody in jail was not known to the early Muslims or to the Arabs. And if you think about it, it's a very inhumane concept to lock somebody up for 20 years in a room. This was not known to uh, the Arabs. So they said, let's basically put a house and put him into that house. And this is what Allah is saying, bituka. They want to tie you up, put you down. And the old man, basically Iblis, said, if you were to do this, his words would still reach his followers. People would smuggle out the Quran and what not to his followers. It's not a good enough plot. Another said, let us send him into exile. أو يخرجوك, Allah says in the Quran. Let us send him into exile, at least he'll be rid of us here in Mecca. Again, Iblis said, sending him into exile is to send him back to his followers. It will strengthen them rather than weaken them. You can't eliminate, you can't get rid of him. And here is where Abu Jahl, of course, was in the audience. And Abu Jahl said, you still haven't said the point that is on everybody's mind, but they're scared to say it. Every one of you is thinking this, but nobody has the guts to come and say it. Well, let me say it, Abu Jahl. Why don't we kill him? But, now the problem would come, and I've said this many times before, it's a matter of honor for the Arabs. It's a matter of law that you don't kill one of your own. It's something that they have never done before. You don't kill one of your own in cold blood. This is something that is, it's something they, for them it would be uh, a mark of humiliation. It would be something their enemies would criticize for the rest of the Quraysh's lives. They'd be criticizing this, right? So Abu uh, Jahal said, but we'll do this in a way that Nobody can get angry at any one tribe. And this was the dastard plot of Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl said, rather than one of us attack him, why not every single tribe sends one representative? And they fight him like one man, such that by the time he's dead, their blood, his blood is on all of their swords. So nobody knows who killed him and all of the tribes are equally to blame. If we do this, no one tribe can be made fun of because they're all guilty. At least the ones in the room, the tribes that were in the room. And he said, the Banu Hashim will have no choice but to accept the blood money. Otherwise, the Banu Hashim would have had to declare war. You see, this is again tribal honor. Has nothing to do with the fact they love or they hate this man. It's tribal honor. It's gang mentality. You harm my gang, I have to kill one of your gang. You kill me, we're going to kill you back. It's gang mentality. So the Banu Hashim, if any other tribe had attacked them, the Banu Hashim would have had to declare war until they killed a good amount of the other enemy. And then they said, okay, this is Qisas. Now, if all of the tribes in Mecca and in the surrounding regions equally participate, the Banu Hashim cannot declare war against all of them. So what are they going to have to do? They're going to have to accept the blood money, the diya. And the, the, the concept of blood money and qisas was pre-Islamic. Islam came and gave it some rules, qawaneen. But the concept of having blood money, diya, and the concept of having qisas, it is pre-Islamic. Islam fine-tuned it and made it uh, precise. Uh, and so they had this notion of blood money. So the uh, Abu Jahl said, if we do this, the Banu Hashim will have no alternative except to take the blood money and khalas, it will be a done deal. This was when Iblis stood up and said, this is, this is the Ra'ya Sadid, this is the smart decision. This is the intelligent decision that there is no other decision to take other than uh, this one. And this was therefore what they all plotted to do. And right then and there, every one of the tribes people thought of one person in their tribe, the, a young strong man whom they could choose for this deed. And they sent them immediately to the house of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this was when Jibreel came down to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and informed him that you must make the Hijrah now. So this was on the same evening that he spoke to Abu Bakr. The same evening. He does not know what's happening. But Jibreel comes and tells him, you need to leave right now. And so Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala informed him of that plot. And Ibn Ishaq reports without any isnad. Uh, and so there's no isnad at all. But this is the famous report that we all know that as they surrounded the house of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went outside reciting Surah Yasin 
reciting Surah Yasin, and they did not recognize him or they did not see him at all. Because Allah Azza wa says, وَجَعَلْنَا بِأَيْدِيهِمْ سَدًّا وَخَلْفِهِمْ سَدًّا فَأَغْشَيْنَاهُمْ فَهُمْ لَا يُبْصِرُونَ We put barriers in front of them and behind them, so we caused them to go blind, or we covered them up, and they couldn't see anything. And so the Prophet recited Surah Yasin, the first verses, and they were blinded to his presence. They didn't see a thing. And Ibn Ishaq mentions that he threw dust on their hair. He threw dust on their hair as a sign of humiliation. Like it's something that is disgusting. Even if one of us has dust on us, we don't like it, right? So he threw dust on every one of them as he walked out. And they didn't even see this until after he had uh, left. Until after he had left. And it is said that uh, at the time he was still living in the house of Khadija, of course, because Khadija has passed away, so he's living in the house. And with him is of course Ali, because he's supposed to be taking care of Ali. Ali grew up in the household of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And Ali, at this uh, stage, Ali is a young boy at the time. Ali is a young boy at the time. He's a teenager. He's a young man, I should say. He's a teenager because Ali has been a Muslim since he was around seven, eight years old. So he's around 19, 18, 19 now at this time. He's a young man at this time. And Ali was told to remain behind in the bed of the Prophet wasallam. You know, they didn't have closed windows. You know, for them, there's this opening there. You look inside and you will see the people inside the house. And so he told Ali to stay in his bed so that if the Quraysh looked in, they would find somebody lying there. And it's dark, nobody sees who it is. They would assume that this is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. All of this, this details of the story, it is found in Ibn Ishaq but without any Isnad. So there is not 100% authenticity but at the same time, there's nothing wrong with affirming these, uh, these stories. Now, Abu Bakr radiallahu an had already prepared the two camels. The Prophet ﷺ came to the house of Abu Bakr in the middle of the night. The two of them in the middle of the night rode their camels and they went to, as we all know, the cave of Thawr, Ghari Thawr. Now, Ghari Thawr is very interesting because it is in the exact opposite direction that Medina is. Medina is due north, straight line. Ghari Thawr is due south, exact opposite. You literally are turning your back to Medina and walking away to get to Gharitho. Literally. And it's a two and a half, three hour walk from Mecca. And so they had already devised a plot, a plan, to go to this cave and stay there for three days and three nights. In utmost secrecy. And then after three days and three nights, they would then meet with a guide who would take them from a path that was unknown to the Quraysh. A path that only some of the Bedouins of other tribes knew. Not the main road, not the highway, a back road. And in fact, they had to circle down to what is now Jeddah. And they were very close to Jeddah. And then they made their way to Medina from Jeddah. And so they didn't take... The, the highway from Mecca to Medina, they actually took the highway, if you like, from Jeddah to Medina. And the modern highway that, is, that they have just now built, the modern highway that they have just now built, I say just now has been at least 15 years, um, but for 40 years before this, back in the 60s and 70s, there was a very old, you must remember it, Uncle, if you're sitting here, you must remember that old, I still have memories of that as well when I was a kid. Uh, there's a very old highway from Mecca, that's, uh, that was another path. The new path, it is actually called Tariq al-Hijrah. That's the name of the highway in our times. Tariq al-Hijrah. Because when the engineers actually found out, when they had a maps and they figured out what's the best way to get from this place to that place, they actually figured out, believe it or not, actually we firmly do believe it, that the best way is Tariq al-Hijrah. Right? The easiest way. And this was not the way that was known to the Arabs at the time. Because in order to do it, you have to go towards Jeddah. So therefore, if you're going from Mecca to Medina, you actually circle a little bit towards Jeddah and then you work your way up. That's the highway of our times. And so the highway that you go to is actually closer to the hijrah of the Prophet ﷺ than the old highway that they had built back in the uh, 50s, back in the 40s and 50s. Now, uh, we had said that Abu Bakr already had this point in mind. And Abu Bakr radiallahu an had a plan how to undertake this journey. We're going to get to this, uh, we're gonna get to this uh, in a while. Before we get there, it is said that when the Prophet ﷺ left Mecca, At-Tirmidhi reports in his Sunan, 
when he passed the final shops of Mecca, because the souq of Mecca was on the outskirts, when he passed the final souq of Mecca, the middle of the night, he turned around to take one final look, and he would not enter Mecca again except as a conqueror. So many years later, except for the one interlude in in the Umrah al Qada, he came for two days or three days and then left. Otherwise, he would not enter Mecca again except as a conqueror uh, eight and a half years later. He turned around and he said, speaking to Mecca generically or metaphorically, he said to Mecca that you are the most blessed land on earth and the most beloved to me. And were it not for the fact that my people have expelled me, I would never have left you. Were it not for the fact that my own people have expelled me, I would not have left you. And this is exactly the wordings that Waraka ibn Nawfal told him almost 13 and a half years ago. When he accepted, Waraka ibn Nawfal told him who that was. Waraka ibn Nawfal said, I wish I were a young man to help you the day that your people will expel you. The exact same wordings. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Awa mukhrijiyahum. My own people are going to expel me. He is saying 30, 13 years later, My qawmi akhrajuni. Exact same wordings. 13 years have gone by. And this is the fulfillment of the prophecy that Waraqa says, because Waraqa knows reality. Waraqa knows what has happened in the past. And so Waraqa says, yes, every prophet has been expelled and you're not going to be any exception. And so, uh, the Prophet ﷺ said this, Ibn Kathir has over here that he also made a long dua. And he has the dua recorded. Uh, it's a long, beautiful dua where he basically asks Allah for protection. He asks Allah to make the safar uh, easy for him. He asks Allah for his mercy and his, uh, and his protection. All of this is uh, mentioned in Ibn Kathir's seerah. I have not found it in any earlier uh, um, one of the classical books Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, knows best. Now, Getting back to the story of uh, uh, Abu Bakr and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and also the version of Aisha. Aisha says that Abu Bakr had planned to stay in the Ghar Thawr for three nights, and they had made an arrangement with two different people, or I should say, three people actually. They had made an arrangement with three people to do three chores. So Abu Bakr has been thinking about this for a long time. The planning has been done. The first was his son Abdullah. Abdullah ibn Abi Bakr. This is Aisha speaking. He was a young, strong man. Very intelligent and very quick to understand. Abdullah ibn Abi Bakr. He's his oldest son and he's younger than Asma. The oldest is Asma, then Abdullah. Uh, and then you have... Uh, Aisha and then you had Abdul Rahman and then you had a third daughter that was born after Abu Bakr died his wife was pregnant uh, and that is Umm Khadija no Umm Kulthum Umm Kulthum the very last daughter of Abu Bakr uh, Umm Kulthum uh, that when when Abu Bakr died he was on his deathbed and he told Aisha take care of your two sisters and your two brothers Aisha said, what two sisters? I only have one sister. And Abu Bakr said uh, that I feel that my wife, she, he had another wife after that, my wife is pregnant and she will give birth to a daughter. And he didn't even know this, she was not visibly pregnant, but he had an intuition from Allah. He had an intuition from Allah and so he died and eight months later, his wife gave birth to Aisha's youngest sister. Aisha's youngest sister. This is Abu Bakr's intuition that Allah had given him. Anyway, getting back here. So Abu Bakr had said to his son uh, Abdullah, and he is the oldest son, Asma is the oldest daughter. His son Abdullah, that every morning he would come out with some food and drink for the cave because they're not going to leave the cave at all. So this is going to be their provision inside the cave. And he would listen to the people of Mecca what they're doing which direction they're heading in. He's a young child, he's not going to be, people are not going to pay attention to him. He's going to be going in the marketplace and eavesdropping. What are the people talking about? Where are the expeditions being sent to? So he would inform them on a daily basis in case they need to modify their plan. So this was Abdullah ibn Abi Bakr's uh, task. 
And he would do this every day. He would just go around as if he's doing his chores, purchasing what needs to be purchased, taking out the goats, doing this and that. In reality, this is just a guise to listen to what the people are talking about. And because he's a kid, nobody's paying attention to him. That's why Aisha says he was a smart kid. He was way ahead of his years. The second person, Aisha says, Amir ibn Fuhayra was Abu Bakr's personal servant, i.e. a slave whom he had freed. Amir ibn Fuhayra. He was Abu Bakr's freed servant. Abu Bakr had a slave, Abu Bakr freed the slave. And so there is a clear sense of loyalty to Abu Bakr. Amir ibn Fuhayra. Amir ibn Fuhayra had the job of taking out the flocks, he would take some money to be a shepherd for the people of Mecca, right? This is the, the most menial job you can do. The process of himself did it. He would be a shepherd. His job was to take out the flocks and make sure that the footsteps of Abdullah ibn Abi Bakr are erased away. Notice. The footsteps of Abdullah ibn Abi Bakr are erased away, right? And so Amir ibn Fuhaira takes the flock of sheep and he grazes back and forth over the footsteps, so that nobody knows where the Prophet has gone. And then there was a third man assigned for the job, and that is Abdullah ibn uh, Arqat or Urayqit. Both are mentioned. Abdullah ibn Arqat or Urayqit, both are mentioned. We don't know the exact name. And his job, he was not from the Quraysh, he was from a faraway tribe, and he was from a Bedouin tribe, and his job was to lead them down this, what we now call Tariq al Hijrah. Because they're not going the famous way, they're going a way that nobody travels, right? Now, I know this is difficult for us to understand. They actually did have highways back in those days. Believe it or not, they did. What is a highway back then? It is a well-traveled road. Well-traveled road. And they would have wells. And they would even have provisions for those who are completely out of everything. They would sometimes build, this would depend on the, uh, the political and the economic state of the, of, the, of the people. But they would have provisions on the road. For those who don't have anything, they would put it up. If you're out of everything, there's going to be some water under some rocks or something. There would be marks, there would be markings. People would know this is the, the path, right? And people would love to take the path, the same reason why we take the major highways and not the back roads. Safety, security, something happens, a major caravan will come. The exact same reasons, right? Nobody just takes a 4x4 four four and goes into the, the desert unless they are of a different spirit, you know? That adventurous spirit. You know, that's not something the average person does. The same thing happens at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. So they hired Abdullah ibn Arqat or Urayqit to tell them of this back road that nobody ever traveled. You wouldn't find a soul on this road unless they happen to be of a similar adventurous spirit. This was not the road that other people travel. And the point was, or the goal was, or the plan was, that Abdullah ibn Urayqit would meet them on the morning of the third night. Three nights in the cave, nobody knows, and then on the morning of the third night, they would... Meet Abdullah ibn Arqat, and he would take, take them on this, uh, on this new uh, road. Now, in a narration that is muttafaq uh, alayh, uh, that's Bukhari and Muslim, Anas ibn Malik says that Abu Bakr narrated to us the details of the journey. Abu Bakr narrated to us the details of the journey, and this is the famous story that all of you know, that Abu Bakr said that now, Ghari Thawr, uh, some of you I'm sure have been there, who's been to Ghari Thawr? The two, three, huh? You've seen it. You've been inside it. Huh? You have been inside. You haven't been inside Ghari Thawr. So Ghari Thawr, when you... Ghari Thawr is not like Ghari Hira. It's very different. Ghari Hira is very different. Ghari Thawr is a very small cave. And the entrance is more on the top. Like you have to wiggle your way in and then jump into. Not really jump, but put your way into the Ghar. Now, in our times, if you go to Ghari Thawr, it's actually a small chamber. That's because there's been probably five million people that have come in and out of it. Every time somebody comes in, you know, it gets a little bit bigger. You know, you take a little bit of sand out, you literally carve out a bigger cave just by walking into and out of it, right? This is basic geology, basic, uh, you know, physics. I mean, everybody who comes in, I, I, believe it or not, every human being who walks into that cave and walks out, the cave will actually expand because of that, right? Uh, another example is the Mount of the Archers, Jabal al ruma Jabal al ruma in the time of the Prophet was at least four times higher than what it is now, 
right? Nobody came and destroyed it, but what happens? <laughs> we all go up and we go down. As we go up and we go down, we take a little bit of the sand with us, right? So what happens over the last 14 centuries, this Jabal has become a little bit of a hill that's maybe, what, three times the size of this masjid, right? Three, four times. It's very small. Even an elderly person can walk all the way to the top and come back down, no problem. That wasn't the way it was back then. Back then it was much higher. By the way, the same happens for Safa and Marwa. Safa and Marwa were much larger than they are now. We only see 10 feet. It was actually more like 100 feet back then. So the point being, this is basic geology, basic human, uh, 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 basic sciences. Jabal Thawr was a very small chamber. And it is said that there was only space literally for two people in that Jabal. So it's not like a little massive chamber that there's, uh, mashallah, ventilation and running water. And No, this is not. It's literally a crevice. That's more like what it is. Just a little crack. And Abu Bakr had uh, planned this to be there for three days. That stay in there. Now Abu Bakr uh, saw the Quraysh walking up and down the cave. Question arises, how did they get there? And this is not mentioned in this narration. It is mentioned in other books, Al, Al Baladuri and other books mention that when the Quraysh figured out that the Prophet had not gone the usual road, because all the other Muhajirun had taken the usual road. All of the other Muhajirun had taken the usual road, but the Quraysh didn't send expeditions to bring them back. Right? If they you, you all know the story. They only did it for Suhaib and a few people. Otherwise, they didn't send an expedition to send them back. If they got to the road, then khalas, okay, who's going to go and get them back? For the Prophet they sent out riders, they sent out every direction, they figure out he's not there. So then, Al-Baladuri says, one of the ancient books, it says, they hired an expert scout. They hired an expert scout to figure out the traces of the camel from the house of Abu Bakr. And so this scout managed to, despite all of the precautions, now he's an expert scout, right? So he has his ways, Allah knows, I have no idea how this person can figure it out, but whether it's through camel dung, yes, camel dung. Because even camels have different dungs. And once you figure out which one this is, uh, you can figure this out. Or I don't know how the other ways as well, but they have their ways. So they hired this expert scout from outside of the city, private detective basically, right? And they bring him to Mecca and they say, trace the footsteps of these two men. And so he leads them to the base of Gharithor. And he goes, this is where I can trace it. From here, it's a mountain I can't follow anymore. From here, it's a mountain. Now, this is skeptical, it's iffy, like this is one theory, so they're, they're not 100% sure he's on the mountain, but this is the best uh, hint they've had for the last three days. So what happens? They all send in the troops and the forces, right? Abu Jahl is there, Al-Walid ibn Uqba is there, uh, uh, Umayyah ibn Khalaf is there, all the big names come, because this is the hint now that they've been wanting, this is better than anything they've gotten. And so this is the famous incident that Abu Bakr looks out and he sees Abu Jahl and uh, Umayyah ibn Khalaf and all of them, that's why they were on the mountain. And this is when he whispers to the Prophet ﷺ that all they need to do is to look into this crevice and they will see us. All they need to do is look into this crevice and they will see us. Uh, he says, uh, If they just look down at their feet where they, we are now, they would see us because the entrance to the cave, it's at feet level. And so the person who's walking outside might see a little bit of a crack and they would assume that the crack is not a cave. They would assume it's just a crack. You know how mountains have these, all these cracks. So Abu Bakr became panicked and he whispered, if they just look down, they'll see us. And this is when the Prophet responded to the famous phrase that all of you should know and memorize. فَقَالَ يَا أَبَا بَكَرْ مَا ظَنُّكَ بِثْنَيْنِ اللَّهُ ثَالِثُهُمَا Oh Abu Bakr, what do you think of two people? Allah is the third of them. What do you think is going to happen? What do you think of two people? Allah is the third of them. Now over here, of course, we all have the... Um, Famous stories of the spider and the tree and the pigeons and all that. Uh, and again, uh, they are mentioned in some of the books. Uh, the, the, the story of the spider web is mentioned in Mustad Imam Ahmad. And there is a slight weakness in it. And so out of all of the stories, this is the best story. There is a slight weakness in it. As for the uh, narration of the tree leaning down over the mouth, or the two pigeons setting up uh, a nest, these are reported with massive uh, missing links. 
So third, fourth generation reporting what happened in the time of the Prophet uh, So no problem narrating it, but we should know that this is not in Bukhari and Muslim. This is not like 100% uh, authentic, but nothing is surprising. If Allah had willed it, then uh, we, don't, we don't have any problem uh, affirming that. So they crossed over the Ghar Thawr and they didn't realize they were in there. And so after the third day, they met Abdullah ibn Arqat or Abdullah ibn Urayqit and the three of them began uh, going on their way to Medina towards the direction of the shore. Now Jeddah is at the shore as you should know. Jeddah is at the shore, Medina, Mecca is uh, inside, inland. So they worked their way down south and then from south they worked their way out basically to what is now Jeddah, right outside of Jeddah and then they began going northwards towards Mecca which is a road that is parallel to the main road from Mecca to Medina but not the main road. It is parallel to it, right? But it is not the main road. And this is the road, as I said today in our times, this is the main highway that runs from Mecca to Medina. It actually goes this way and then upwards because we have discovered that this is actually the fastest way to get to Medina in our times. And that's what this discovery was only uh, recent. And on the way to Medina, a number of stories are, nar are narrated. Uh, most important of them, two stories are narrated that are... Uh, clearly authentically narrated. The first of them is the story of Suraqa ibn Malik and uh, the second of them is the story of Umm Ma'bad. Suraqa ibn Malik and Umm Ma'bad. Very briefly, uh, these are stories that all of you should be familiar with. And they are narrated with authentic chains. Suraqa ibn Malik was from the tribe of uh, uh, Malik ibn, uh, uh, from the tribe of Ju'shim. Uh, and he was not from the Quraysh basically, he was from one of the Bedouin tribes. And he was the leader of the tribe. He was the leader of the tribe. And the booty, the bounty, the war money of a hundred camels had been placed on Abu Bakr and the Prophet Dead or alive, anybody who finds them gets a hundred camels. That's a lot of money. A hundred camels is a lot of money. The Prophet didn't even own one camel until the Hijrah. Right? A camel is like a car. Imagine a hundred cars. It's a lot of money. And so there's a hundred Camels, whoever catches the Prophet and Abu Bakr, dead or alive, no questions asked. Suraqa ibn Malik narrates the story to us himself in the first person. That's why it's very interesting. He narrates the story after he accepts Islam. Uh, and Suraqa ibn Malik says that he was sitting with his uh, fellow tribesmen and the news comes that they're searching for three riders. Because now they've discovered the plot. They discover Abu Bakr and uh, the Prophet and a guide. Three people have left. So the news goes out. It's on the grapevine. Three riders in the desert. If you find them dead or alive, and they are the Prophet they would then they are. Uh, you get a hundred camels. So Raqqa says, I was sitting with my tribesmen, and one of my uh, people came back from a hunting expedition, and he says, I saw three people in the distance. I'm sure this must be the three the Quraysh are looking for. Suraqa got greedy. And Suraqa wanted the hundred for himself, not to share it with anybody. So immediately he lied and he says, Oh no, no, that's not those three. That's the party of so and so. They told me they're going on an ex expedition in that region. He lied. That's not those three, there's somebody else. I know uh, who they are. Don't worry about that. So he sat down, the man who thought it was, came home excited, he sat down, conversation continued. Suraqa says when they forgot about the incident, because he played it cool, he slipped away, rushed back home, got his war horse ready, put on his armor, and galloped at lightning speed as fast as he could to get to those three people. Because he has bows and arrows, and it says dead or alive, khalas, he can kill them without even coming close, and he'll get a hundred camels. And... Suraqa says, uh, the, famous, the story is famous, I'll have to summarize it because time is limited, uh, that when he saw them for the first time in the distance, all of a sudden, my horse sunk into the ground and threw me, flipped me over. And it had never done this before. In another version he said, that I could see a smoke between me and the three riders. Something's clearly wrong. And so he said, I pulled out my Aslam. Aslam is their, uh, their method of predicting the future. Islam is like tarot cards or reading your palms or something like this. They had a, uh, they had, uh, they had a type of istisqa bil Islam, which basically means they're going to ask the gods what should be done. Call it a pagan salat al-istikhara. Okay? <laughs> Call it a pagan salat al-istikhara. That's really what it is. Okay? So, he said, I pulled out those Islam. What is Islam, by the way? It's... Uh, 
It's arrows that has certain things on it. You know, literally like you have the tarot cards or Ouija boards, it has these weird symbols and whatnot. You need to interpret it your own way. So he has those things with him. So he said, I threw out my Aslam onto the sand to see which direction is going to go, see all of that. And the response that I got was, do not proceed. I ignored it and continued going because he wants the money, right? The second time I came closer, once again, the exact same thing happened. Once again, I was thrown across the horse. Once again, I took it out. Once again, it says, do not proceed. I ignored it and went for the third time until finally they were within uh, yelling distance. I could, I could speak to them. And for the third time, my horse did it even more violently. And I knew that this was a force beyond me. I knew that this was a man I could not reach beyond my taqa, beyond my power. And he said in this hadith, he said, and I knew that the affair of this man would spread, i.e. Islam would spread. I knew that the affair of this man would spread. So I called out to them that I am a safe person, I'm not going to harm you, give me permission to come close. Subhanallah, from the hunted he becomes the one asking permission. Right? From the one who's hunting, he becomes the one asking permission. And he, he narrates an interesting thing. He says, when I saw them in the distance, I forgot to mention this, when I saw them in the distance, I saw that one of the two, i.e. Abu Bakr, was riding in a very agitated state, always looking right and left, sometimes behind, sometimes going to the front, sometimes going by behind, sometimes going to the front. Because he's so worried, about the Prophet ﷺ, that he's worried he's going to be attacked from the back, he goes in the back. Then his paranoia gets the better of him. What if he's attacked from the front? He goes to the front. Right? He cannot concentrate. Whereas the other rider was riding calmly and peacefully. Not turning once left or right, reciting something. Reciting the Qur'an. Reciting something. The status of Abu Bakr is the status of, 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 of the Prophet ﷺ, right? Abu Bakr is very worried. Wanting to protect. And the Prophet is not even looking. Not, no, he's just tawakkul ala Allah now. He knows Allah will protect him. So when he finally got permission to come, uh, to come forth, what, uh, uh, Suraqa ibn Malik says that, I asked permission from the Prophet wasallam to give me protection in writing. Allah, it's an amazing thing. One minute he wants to pull his arrow to kill them. The next minute he says, I knew that their affair would spread everywhere. So I wanted protection when that happened. I didn't want to be hurt when that happened. So I asked for protection. A man. A man means we're not going to harm you. Right? Well, amazing. Look at how in one instance from the hunted to begging permission to live basically. And the Prophet allowed Abdullah ibn uh, Arqat to write down on a scroll, write down on a parchment, a man for Suraqa ibn Malik. That you will be safe. Suraqa ibn Malik, you're going to be safe. We're not going to harm you. You, uh, uh, you protected us today. We're going to protect you tomorrow whenever the need comes. Suraqa said, I offered them some food. And the both of them refused. They had no need of it. They were prepared for that. They had no need of this. But Abu Bakr said, Ikhfi anna. Don't tell anybody about us. That's the one request we have. Don't tell anybody about us. And so Suraqa didn't tell anybody about them until finally he went, uh, when they did arrive in Medina, by the way, Suraqa told them all the story that happened and uh, Abu Jahl wrote him a scathing poem uh, where he called Suraqa the foolish, that you let them go and you did this and this and you know, you're basically an idiot basically. It's very harsh poetry he wrote him, that they slipped out of your hands. And Suraqa wrote back poetry, this all in Ibn Ishaq. And he said to him that, had you been there on that day and you had seen what I had seen, then you wouldn't be saying what you're saying. I know what happened, you don't know what happened. Okay, I saw with my own eyes, you didn't see what I saw. And so eventually, after the battle of Hunayn, uh, of course, by the way, in one riwayah, Ibn Abdul Bar says this. What I mentioned to you is, is Muslim Imam Ahmad. Ibn Abdul Bar, another very early author, says that when the Suraqa turned to leave, the Prophet ﷺ for the first time turned to him and said to him, Ya Suraqa, kayfa bik? O Suraqa, how will you be the day that you put on the bracelets of Kisra? How will you be the day that you put on the bracelets of Kisra? 
Suraqa, shocked, couldn't say anything other than Kisra, the son of Hurmuz. Like, as if we said the president, there's only one president. As if you said the king in any land of kings, there's only one king. There's only one Kisra, right? But he can't, like, Kisra, the son of Hurmuz, meaning the emperor of Persia? You want me to wear his bracelets or I'm going to wear his bracelets? And that's it, the Prophet didn't even respond. How will you be the day that you put on the bracelets of... Now, Kisra was uh, well known for the jewelry that he would wear as a man. He's a man, but he would wear jewelry, right? Not to mention things that you shouldn't be seeing, but if you've seen the movie 300, you've seen the leader of the, of the Persians dressed in all these weird things, right? That's basically Kisra there. That's the, uh, the, the, idea, the idea of the Roman or the Persian emperors. There would be bracelets and earrings and whatnot. This is, they were dressed like this. And he had very expensive jewelry. He had very expensive gold and decorated bracelets. Well known. Everybody envied him for this. Okay, So the Prophet is saying, how are you going to be the day that you wear those bracelets of Kisra? Right? And on the day of Hunayn, which is after the conquest of Mecca, the Prophet conquered uh, basically the other tribes outlying Mecca, and he finally conquered the tribe of Suraqa ibn Malik. Suraqa pulled out the very piece of paper that he had. It's not paper, it's actually parchment. He pulled out the very piece of leather that he had, that the Prophet ﷺ had written to him almost 10 years ago, eight, nine years ago. And the Prophet ﷺ recognized Suraqa, and he gave him the security, he gave him the aman, and Suraqa accepted Islam, and Suraqa became a well-known uh, Sahabi after this. And he migrated to Medina, he lived in Medina. The Prophet ﷺ passed away within six, seven years of his death. Uh, the the mighty nation of the Sassanid Persians collapsed, as we talked about, in the battle of uh, Qadisiyah, was the beginning of the end of the Sassanids, and eventually uh, Perisopolis, which is still standing to this day, still standing to this day, Perisopolis, which is a city outside of Tehran, which was the capital of the Sassanids. You have pillars in the middle of the desert, literally like 100, 200 feet just in the air going, it's amazing. You just see pictures of it in our times. We are astounded to this day. These massive palaces, completely empty and abandoned, right? From the middle of nowhere, you see to this day, it's amazing architecture. Uh, the, eventually, Perisopolis was conquered, that is the capital of the Sassanids. And as is typical, all of the, per, the, the jewelry, all of the treasures of the palace are gathered and sent to Umar ibn al-Khattab. And in the masjid, they're opened up. The masjid of the Prophet ﷺ is full of treasures and gold. And when he sees the palace treasure, he says, where is Suraqa? Call Suraqa for me. And so Suraqa is called, he's found in the city, he called. And Umar puts him on his own chair. And Umar finds in that gold, the bracelets of Kisra. Because everybody knows the promise. Everybody knows what the Prophet said. These are now legends everybody's heard. He finds the two bracelets of Kisra. He puts them on the hand of Suraqa ibn Malik. And the entire congregation starts saying, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. This is the fulfillment of what the Prophet ﷺ said. And in fact, the version Ibn Abd al-Bar says, they took Suraqa around Medina. Can you imagine the bracelets of Kisra, the most powerful man? Now, and uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab said, Alhamdulillah, who has taken these bracelets away from Kisra, the son of Hurmuz, and given them to Su Suraqa, a Bedouin from the tribe of the Bani, the tribe of the Banu Mudlij, uh, Alhamdulillah, who has taken them from this mighty man and given them to this Muslim as what the Prophet ﷺ predicted so many years ago. SubhanAllah, what an amazing story. And it is clearly mentioned in our books. And it is one of the many, many miracles that are mentioned uh, in the time of the Prophet ﷺ. We don't have time for the story of Umm Ma'bad. We will continue the story of Umm Ma'bad, inshaAllah, next Wednesday. And then as well, uh, talk about the entrance of the Prophet ﷺ to Medina. And inshaAllah, also next Wednesday, we we'll talk about a very important topic and that is why Medina? We didn't talk about this yet. Why Medina? Why did Allah choose this city and not so many other cities? That's a question that has many responses and reasons to. There's a deep and profound wisdom and that is inshallah something we'll talk about inshallah next Wednesday uh, if we're able to do all of that. We have a few minutes left for questions and then some announcements as usual and then we'll break for Salat Al-Isha. So, yeah, inshallah, next week and next Wednesday, so we're going to talk about some of the wisdoms of the seerah. One of the wisdoms of the seerah 
that we learned of the Hijrah, excuse me, one of the wisdoms of the Hijrah, Abdullah ibn Arqat or Urayqit uh, was not from the Quraysh, by the way. He was not from the Quraysh. He was not from the Quraysh. And he was also not a Muslim. He was upon the religion of his people, i.e. he was a, a, a mushrik. And it's very amazing that they paid him a sum that must have been a fraction of a hundred camels. He's a guide. He gets paid, right? He gets paid a small amount. They paid him a sum that is a fraction of the hundred camels. But he still did it. Why? Many scholars, not just me, have tried to find out as much as they can about Abdullah ibn Arqat. We don't have any references. In fact, we don't even know if he accepted Islam. At the time, he was clearly a pagan. The earliest scholars, Ibn Hajar himself, I joked up today, Ibn Hajar says, I searched and I couldn't find anything about this man. After this incident, we don't hear from him again. Did he accept? Did he not accept? We don't even know. One can assume he accepted, but we don't have anything narrated if he accepted or not. Clearly, therefore, we have to assume that the Prophet ﷺ, Abu Bakr knew something about this man that we don't know and that he was a trustworthy person. And this is something we know for a fact that many non Muslims can be very trustworthy and many Muslims can be very untrustworthy, right? We know this for a fact. So, Abdullah ibn Arqat was somebody that they both trusted. That he was an honest man and he would do this for them and not betray them for a larger sum of money. And the fact of the matter, Allah says in the Quran, وَمِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ There are people of the Ahli Kitab, if you were to give them a treasure, they would be honest and return it to you. And there are others, if you were to give them a few measly coins, they try to trick you out of it. This is the reality. That you will find people who are non-Muslims, pagan, idol worshippers, Hindu, Jew, Buddhist, atheist, and they're honest. Islam doesn't necessarily make you automatically honest if you don't practice it. Correct? We all know this the hard way, many of us, right? And vice versa as well. That you will find people who have good manners. Allah mentions this in the Quran, but they don't have iman. So, and so this shows us as Muslims, we clearly are allowed to use the services, even trust non-Muslims, if we feel that they're honest people. Honesty is what is important here. And it's clear that the both of them felt Abdullah ibn Arqat was an honest, trustworthy man. Other questions before we have some announcements? Yes. Uh, Excellent point, and I was going to mention this next Wednesday as well. Abu Jahl came to interrogate Asma, and in fact, he beat her up until she bled, but she refused to say a word. So they did interrogate. But they couldn't get it out. Aisha was too young. And of course, the father is Abu Qahafa, he's a pagan, he doesn't know. The father wanted to criticize Abu Bakr and he ended up you know, being tricked by, by, As, by Asma. So Asma was doubly punished, once by her grandfather uh, who taunted her, and then by Abu Jahl who physically beat her. Abu Jahl came and uh, tried to get it out of her, but he wasn't able to do so.